Hello everyone, welcome to BizPod Behaviour Intervention Support Network's podcast and I am delighted to be joined once again by Mr Barry Ronson. Now I did it on purpose that time Harry. <laughs> yeah, when you do it on purpose it makes me think, hey give me my old name back immediately. Oh no, oh no, I should, I should have quit while I was ahead, never mind. <laughs> we meet again Sam Harris. Um, so Harry is back to talk with me um, again about sort of his take on um, well, we, we said the topic today, the thing I want to talk, talk to you about today, Harry, was labelling, really. Um, terminology, I, I sometimes use a silly quote in my training that, you know, would a rose by any other name smell as sweet? Well, yeah, it would still smell as sweet, but if you called it a stinking arsehole, you wouldn't smell it in the first place. So That's a good what point. we call things does, I think, make a difference in, in how we approach things. Mm. Um, and we were talking the other day and we were, we're doing a webinar together, which again, also very excited about. We'll talk a bit about that at the end, maybe. Um, and we were talking about the title for it. And I think in some of my webinars recently, I've been using the sort of title autism and demand avoidance um, brackets yeah. PDA. I kind of want to catch everyone I can, really. Um, yeah. But you, you had some thoughts on that and you, you weren't so sure about that. Yeah, I understand your intention there and it is a noble one but <laughs> it's not quite the same that's the thing you see um so demand avoidance is seen not just right across the autism spectrum but it's something many of us face we all know the teenager who can't keep their room clean mm. we've all heard of the student who is unwilling to help wash the dishes or clean the toilet you know, we all know what it feels like, um, perhaps after Christmas, and we've eaten too much, and we don't want to resume our exercise routines, you know. So it's very important that we underpin demand avoidance of the PDA kind, okay. and really kind of um, burrow into its uh, essence, as it were. So I suppose, if we consider autism and demand avoidance, it makes me think of very rational forms of demand avoidance. They being um, the child who is unable to um, enter a children's play arena because there are too many other children there, there are too many noises and there are too many smells. And see, this would be a very rational form of demand avoidance. Um, one can understand how a child um, with sensory differences uh, would avoid such situations. Um, perhaps also demand avoidance which follows from burnout, which is no stranger to any autistic person. Um, you reach a point where, as we like to say in the autistic community, you are simply out of spoons. <laughs> and when you have no more spoons to give, then then you can't do anything. So these are forms of what I would call rational demand avoidance. Um, perhaps even you can consider executive functioning. Um, for ADHD people, um, any task that requires a lot of mental energy is likely to be avoided. Um, the tolerance of boredom is that low that any activity that isn't stimulating or invigorating will deplete an ADHD person of, their, of all of their energy very quickly. And then we can move along to um, demand avoidance of the PDA kind. First and foremost, let's um, unpack the name PDA. That P standing for pathological is a huge problem because when you are an insider, you can't help but feel. Who decides what is pathological and what isn't? As the insider, I wouldn't describe any of my behaviours as pathological, but I can understand why, when it comes to the demand avoidance, a word like irrational is applied to it, because very often um, PDA people end up avoiding things that they really like to do. And sometimes it can be really difficult 
to explain what's going on because it seems to it doesn't seem to be contingent upon any obvious factors it has nothing to do with being low in spoons you can have all the spoons in the world and for whatever reason you still can't do the thing that you are expected to do it has nothing to do with a lack of confidence because many people might find this kind of situation difficult because they would feel too exposed and then they would avoid this situation and that's a form of demand avoidance too it's it's rational why did you avoid um recording a uh, podcast with sam harris oh, because it was such a daunting activity sam harris is amazing and i heard harry thompson was going to be there too okay enough of that um so the you know th these are obvious and i use i use um quite a good example of being really um I was, I was, I've always been so into music and I began playing on stage when I was about 14. Um, so it had nothing, I, I didn't really experience the, the whole shyness aspect, but I can recall a time when I was 18 and it was a time in my, that was a tricky year in my life. A lot went wrong. Um, it was, it was um, kind of, the whole year was coated in this really heavy depression. And then I went to live with one of my mentors um, and I kind of went through a process of transformation. And, you know, I, I, I was drinking heavily and I was um, taking a lot of uh, drugs and um, engaging in um, naughty behaviors, let's say. And then I went to live with my mentor and I stopped drinking, I stopped taking drugs, I was doing yoga, I was, I was working out, and I was going to all these different kind of like self-development courses. And one of the things I did was go on a retreat. And when I went on, and as, we, as I would normally do, I took my guitar, because for me, music is a really important therapy. Um, and I can remember the person who was running the retreat asked me if I would consider getting my guitar. And I ended up ripping out the strings. So some people might say, oh, were you intimidated by playing in front of a load of people? And it had nothing to do with that whatsoever because I knew I'd done it before. And I knew it was the kind of thing I really liked doing. But for me, in that moment, ripping this, and this is a little bit of an, embar an embarrassing admission. I don't know how to restring a guitar. I've been playing guitar since I was 11. I have no idea how to restring it. I've never learned and I never will. I refuse. Um, so I, then, I, then you immediately regret it afterwards. I remember thinking, for the rest of the week, I don't have my guitar right now. I could have just played a single song like I've done many times before. But because someone asked, if, asked me to do it, I was completely unable. So you, you, you tap, you um, somehow fall into this heightened fight or flight response when you are confronted with a demand. It's the demand itself that has to be avoided because the demand um, represents a huge threat to your autonomy. And your autonomy is something, as a PDA person, you identify with so strongly. And when there is no autonomy, there is no life. So it directly impinges upon your life. At least that's what it feels like from a subjective point of view. So, so sorry, Harry, can I just interject and try and sum cool. it up in my in my Someone's brain. got to stop me rambling. Well, it's only because only so I can sort of qualify it, I guess. So I guess you're looking at um, demand avoidance is a behaviour and could come from yeah. different places. Yeah. Um, but you're saying that, you know, with, with lots of people, autistic people, you know, people in general, I think there's a, um, a rational reason for avoiding a demand mm. that has to do with the context the demand yeah, is in. Yeah, but actually with with um with PDA or as as a as a well see that's the thing I'm not even sure about calling it PDA because it's but you're saying it's it's definitely a different thing. It's the avoidance of the demand itself, log, logic and context out the window. Yeah. Yeah. I would say so. refer to it as because I, I get, I like what you're saying as well about the pathology side of things, but yeah. it, it's almost like how, as a as an outsider, then how do I look to support someone who's having that demand avoidant behaviour? 
how do I understand whether it's coming from demands itself or actually a very logical reason for the context, the context they're avoiding? Um, it's a bit like ask, it's a bit like I'm trying to help a depressed person. Mm. You know, it's like, OK, before you have um, declared definitively that you are depressed, have you asked yourself these questions? You know, do you f are you lonely? You know, do you do you lack anything in life? Um, what, perhaps what's your diet like? You know, do you exercise? You know, how much sunlight do you get? You know, you want to eliminate any potential external influence on your mood before um, before you can really definitively say what it is. You know, um, you know, if if I felt depressed, that's what I do. I would think I would give my life a thorough kind of um, analysis and it's the same with the demand avoidance in order to support someone you could start by tweaking things in the environment you could consider first is it too loud in here you could consider secondly um what i want them to do is it a good idea is it causing them more harm than good i would i would um i would um i would assess the environment thoroughly. I, I I would I would do that, and then perhaps if all else fails, you could be looking at a situation whereby demand avoidance of the PDA kind is the only last uh, thing it could possibly be. Um, that's, that's interesting because um, I, 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 it was interesting to hear you talk about the avoiding things that. That you want to do and I, I quite often say to parents in, in practice that actually for me that's that's a really key indicator is if if the young person has decided or chosen an activity and then you present that activity and that gets shut down that that to me is is a bigger indicator than someone that just avoids demands because when we say someone avoids demands yeah. what you say it might be they're avoiding the demand of an environment not the demand okay. itself yeah yeah that's yeah. a really important distinction for teachers and parents and anyone involved with these children to make. But I, I do remember, you know, um, so what, when I first sort of started working, I, I think I worked with my first young man that I think would fit the PDA profile back in 2008. And I'd done all the traditional kind of autism training and put those kind of strategies in place. And we had a summer with that particular young man where I put in, you know, a sort of gold standard teach approach to autism support and it did genuinely make make things much worse i think okay um, yeah so i get what you're saying about i think you you bang on we need to support the environment and check all the other boxes but i do worry that sometimes the delivery of traditional autism supports actually make that demand yeah. work more present not least because it's traditional you see yes yeah <laughs> every last detail will be scrutinized by the PDA child. You know, what is this person's goal here? Why mm. are they presenting me with this? Um, I often give the example of how to engage them with their interests. Because often um, uh, someone who is supporting them or a teacher may recognize that the child is particularly engrossed in something and they think, oh, that's it. That's how we're going to engage them. But then they find that it still doesn't work. And then they can't understand why. And it's because of your attitude towards that, with, that in which they are interested. Because that in which they are interested um, cannot be used as this kind of manipulative ploy um, to steer them towards what, they're, what the teacher wants them to do. You know, it, it doesn't work like that. They'll recognize that you are exploiting their interest for their benefit, you know, because the teacher probably can't help at that point think oh but they're falling behind you know we've got to do something um time is running out and all of those worries that the teacher harbors are going to be received and ten tenfold by the child you know so every you have to every last detail matters when you're supporting these children every last emotion you feel have you got any ulterior motive whatsoever when you are approaching them? It's so hard. I, I understand it's hard, but that's an insight into what we're doing with our environment. Every last detail gets picked up. 
Do you know, I mean, it, it, it is hard, I think, because it goes counter to what we as in professionals in, in this kind of work, we, we're quite often, I guess, led towards a certain way of interacting, particularly with young people. And it's often lots of enthusiasm, lots of kind of reinforcement and pray. And, mm. and actually, sometimes I think what you're speaking to is a need for honesty. And actually, that That's shouldn't sweet. be as hard. But, but maybe. But it is, though, isn't it? Yeah, it can be, yeah. I mean, I always felt like when I started working with young people, I was kind of faking it a bit anyway. So actually, when I realised I could be a bit more myself, it actually, it was easier for me. It does, because then it becomes our objective. Hmm. Because we'll, we'll notice the inauthenticity, the dishonesty, and then it becomes our job to break it down. Hmm. You know? And then that's, yeah. that's hugely distracting. Even with, I remember... I'm a, I'm a musician, but I resisted my piano lessons because my teacher would not reveal to me how old she was. <laughs> you know? So then I began to be excited about the lesson because oh, today she is going to reveal to me her age. Right. You know? so, and you got really fixed up. And, and yeah. See, right, right. Sorry, could you say that again? So did you get really fixated on that and then sort of to the detriment of the lesson and everything else? Or? Hugely. I tried everything. You know, like I thought, mm, 1979, yeah, good year that. What year, how old would you have been that year? And she said, I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to work out how old I am, you know. So I was like, damn it, you know, I, I wouldn't stop trying. So I began to look forward to my piano lesson for that reason. And I play piano now and I love it. But at the time I had no interest because I had to know, um, I, I had to manipulate the piano teacher into fleshing out every last one of her vulnerabilities. You know, I could tell, oh, there's something you're concealing there. Allow me to help you embrace um, your mortality. Would you call so that, that a response yeah. to like an intense suspicion then? That because she wouldn't tell you something, it was kind of like it put you on edge? Or was it more just intrigue and, you know, you enjoyed doing that? I'd say a bit of both. On one hand, it's, how can I truly cooperate with you if you're not 100% honest with me about everything? Fair point. And on the other hand, because you're not 100% honest with me, I'm going to find fun in this situation anyway. But then do you think that would be where perhaps that's part of your personality rather than label? Because you know, I've worked with other young people where it feels like if they can't get that... Um, response then it's it's quite an explosive situation sometimes yeah would or would you have exploded about that when you were younger or but i was having fun in the process you're enjoying yeah. it so there was intolerance of uncertainty uh -huh. surrounding not knowing what her age was but my methods were enjoyable so that helped to appease the frustration okay and if it wasn't an enjoyable method and i would have tried to take it by force and would have ended up being unsuccessful mm. then more of an explosive reaction would have been likely okay um just go i mean i've enjoyed every minute of it but we've gone a bit off topic but it's been good sure. <laughs> i don't mind at all <laughs> but going back to this kind of labeling then because yeah. um i don't know what it's like at your your end of the country but but in the southwest at the moment we, we're kind of the labeling um you know, obviously, if a young person comes to me and they've got a diagnostic in place, it's, it's really variable. It's kind of shifted from, I think it was autism with demand avoidance, with demand avoidant traits. Now we're seeing PDA traits. I've also seen yeah. autism with a PDA profile. Huge sort of jumble of, of, of different ways of labelling this. Um, and I, I really agree with what you're saying about the, diff, the need for a differential between thought through logical yeah. contextual demand avoidance and almost instinctive demand avoidance. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So w would there be, I mean, you, you, you still use the PDA as a label. Yeah. You know, I just see it as PDA though. If I really think about it, I, I right. never, I never, um, I never unpack each, uh, letter I just see P I just say it, I just think of it as PDA when the child has a diagnosis of autism with a PDA profile mm. I think that is the most accurate 
I don't like the pathologizing language. I don't like the term autism spectrum disorder, you know, um, but being autistic is something many people in the autistic community are very proud of, you know, mm. so being autistic comes first. And then if I am to um, specify what that means, I am autistic with a PDA profile. Mm. Um, if, and you're, you're absolutely right. Um, in a, in an, in an official diagnosis, we often see different names, different labels. Um, some people take issue with the word label as well, by the way, they say, no, this is a diagnosis, not a label. Yep. Um, 100%. it's not, you know, and they'll say something like, um, uh, being stupid and lazy are labels, but being autistic, uh, is my diagnosis, which is, um, a signpost towards perhaps support and greater understanding. Um, so, when it's, aut when it's autism and demand avoidance, to me, that's not PDA, it's different because I think it's so important for a diagnostician to specify as to the nature of the demand avoidance because it's not as simple as it's all the same thing because it's just not. Yeah. I, I've, so here's, here's an interesting thought. I think you can even have a person who is even more demand avoidant than someone who is PDA, but their demand avoidance the frequency, the frequency could be more of that of a PDA individual, but the type of demand avoidance they're displaying isn't the demand avoidance of the PDA kind. Mm. You know, so that might be um, a totally new concept for people to wrap their heads around. Because I think with PDA, avoid. it's not just about the frequency; it's about the type of demand avoidance that it is. Mm. So I think autistic with a PDA profile would accurately describe someone of this ilk. Mm -hmm. And do you get, I mean, so a, a few years back, I, I sort of ventured into the netherworld of Twitter. Um, okay. and, and, I, and I, you know, I must admit, I'd probably be a bit naive at the time, but I talked about how in our training, we were, we were referring to um, people with autism you know, person first language, and okay. I've got my um, I've got my sort of ear bent and a few expletives thrown my way, and rightly yeah. so in some ways um, by some autistic individuals that said this had been settled, the, the work was done. It's it's autistic people. Um, yeah, autism's you know something I am part of. I am not something I could just get rid of or something like that. Um, yeah, and so we changed it as a result, but, but I did look into it and I think that the study was a bit like Brexit, you know, the NAS did a big study and it was kind of 51, 49. It, it wasn't hugely clear cut. Um, and so I guess, you know, uh, I'm wondering where, where you stand on that and what, what your kind of thoughts are, whether you think. I use identity first. Mm -hmm. I say I am autistic. I say I'm a PDA person. I'll describe a child as a PDA child. Um, I, I'm not as militant as some people can be. Um, I will always endeavor to explain why identity first is a lot more accurate and a lot more humanitarian, mm -hmm. but I don't jump down people's throats if they use person first language. I have friends who might use person first language unthinkingly. Um, and I have, I have friends who are autistic who might use person first language occasionally, person with autism. Um, I don't, I know that they know they can't separate themselves from being autistic, mm. you know? So I'll choose my battles. I'm much more likely to challenge a person who isn't autistic. I will challenge a person who isn't autistic as to why it is a lot more, um, it, it's, it's, it's more respectful to the community if you use identity first. Mm. Um, and I want to know their intent behind using such language. It's, a, it's I mean, it's kind of accurate. I, I, some, but the thing is as well, I'm a huge philosophy nerd. So I try and experiment with other concepts. Do I have blue eyes or am I a blue eyed person? You know, 
is there dust on this table or is it a dusty table you know so I, mean, I often answer those I hope not because I, I wouldn't know where to begin with that <laughs> no but I, I throw that I throw that at my um autistic friends sometimes just to watch their reaction you know because I will I am identity first language all the way but I never stop I'm, I'm never 100 percent comfortable in my worldview i always have to challenge myself and I, I want to challenge other people's perception of the world so i have that in me i have okay we all we're all um throwing in the knot with identity first language fantastic you know are we sure about this you know we are but i just want to make sure we're sure and um it's um i suppose it gets difficult with pete when it comes to pda because let's think so we have we have words like pda -er that's mm. actually become so mainstream i can't use it anymore oh really it's because you mentioned oh, yeah. the other day that you didn't like it i was going to ask why because it's just so mainstream i hear it constantly okay and people have picked that up on my page they i think i have actually mentioned it before that I use it sometimes because it just rolls off the tongue. Mm. I'm a PDA, -er, he's a PDA, -er, she's a PDA. -er. But oh my gosh, it's everywhere that word. You can't escape it. And because of which, I, I went through a period of renouncing the word completely. But now I came out about that and people are saying PDA person and PDA individual on my page. And I'm like, no, I've got to say PDA -er now. Now this is becoming too mainstream. Okay. So, <laughs> is that so? Could that be applied to anything though? If, so, where, so if we start saying autism with a PDA profile too much, is that gonna? Um, I would end? likely every step of the way, I will be one step ahead of you all. <laughs> when I was little, my mum no, used to. I'm get... really, Harry, I'm I'm really sorry. I'm just going to move rooms quickly. When I was little, my mum used to buy this jar of sauce or this condiment called salsa relish. And I decided I much preferred the word relish over salsa. Um, it was so much more stimmy. There's something about the lish that, that sends shivers down my spine. Um, but my mum would always default to calling it salsa. And I could not tolerate it. I would order everyone in the house to call it relish. And they wouldn't do it. So every time she'd buy a jar, I would rip out the word salsa. So that you could only see the word relish. You know, so there is that kind of tendency um, within me. And I th even, and this is, sometimes I have to separate my devotion to my community with my PDA because, because the majority of people use identity first language. Sometimes it makes me want to lean towards person first language just to be difficult, you know, just to be difficult. Some of the, some of the, more popular views held by the majority of autistics the fact that they're popular makes me shy away from them even if there is a perfectly good reason to hold these views now i have to i have to snap out of it because many of these views are so important and i do hold them and i can steer clear of controversy for the most part sometimes if i'm working closely with people and there's debate around what language to use i will play the devil's advocate because I'm too, I'm in too close proximity to the discussion. You know, when I kind of step back and I can write blogs in my own time, I'll always use identity first language. I'll always um, be in keeping with what the community wants. But sometimes, if I'm working too close amongst individuals, the need to go against the grain will uh, hijack uh, my psyche. Have you have you always had? um an awareness of that or is that something because it sounds like now that's something you would acknowledge be aware of but but actually limit so that it doesn't impact the work you do um but when you were younger did you just kind of automatically do that and not know why or when, when did you get an awareness but, you were doing that but sometimes i will still automatically do it oh, okay. you know i will i will take up the opposition just for the kick of it and it depends on what i'm doing so i will what i'll do now is i'll very carefully assess whether it's worth it or not you know so I'll, I'll think ahead i'll think okay i can be recklessly impulsive in this moment or i can 
sometimes I'll have to remove myself from pro projects because I know I won't be able to help myself. Um, so I suppose it depends on how important the thing is to myself and other people. Mm. Um, I'll, I'll consider long-term control. I'll consider, okay, if I seize all control in this moment, am I going to lose it further, further into the future? If yes, it's perhaps not a good idea to act on impulse in this situation. Um, can I act on impulse here? You know, because some, some of the, uh, so I, so right, when I'm doing my Facebook lives, sometimes I just allow myself to dis descend into complete anarchy and chaos because I, I know that there are no risks involved whatsoever. I know that I will be okay after it. Um, in, a kind, in a podcast situation, I notice that I'll contain myself slightly more. You know, um, this isn't the first podcast I've done and I feel quite relaxed here mm. and I don't have any reason to disrespect you and violate you. I have no reason whatsoever. We're cooperating and this is an even keel and it's all flowing so I can work well with you. In other situations, it may not be like that. You know, I may be, um, I I'll tap into performance art and I'll sing songs and I'll say rude things and my motive becomes shock, 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 shock. Now, how do I get you there for episode three? Because that could be an interesting one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Not that I was wanting you to get comfortable, but no, I know that's the, that's the thing as well. You know, people do that. Like they try and they try and tease it out of you, and then it never works. You see, um, if people want to see a kind of small example of that, then I'll refer them to uh, my new Facebook page, or Academy, and there's a there's a video of me talking with um, Richard Woods. And that's an example where I, 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 have, to, I have to be chaotic. Hmm. Okay. But you wouldn't be able to say what it was about that that... Oh, it's usually the person. It's the person and what they're doing. Um, it's the whole dynamic. The dynamic... I, I will... I am beholden to any dynamic in any context. You know, I will, I will rapidly adapt to each situation and provide the situation with exactly what it's lacking. So right now, we're balancing each other. So I can, I can be a, a more stable version of myself. If this situation was lacking something, I would have to become the embodiment of that which the situation lacks. And I never know what that is. And then I look back and think, oh yeah, because in that situation, it was slightly too serious and drab. So I had to completely become flamboyant and outrageous. Oh, I see. So, so it's, no, it's, it's always a balancing act, but that's what PDA is. PDA is about balancing and compensation. It always is. There's not enough freedom here. So I'm going to completely halt any bodily uh, function. I'm not going to move forward. I'm not going to cooperate because I am now representing that which this classroom environment lacks. There's no ability to maneuver. There's no ability to um, allow my mind to do its own thing. So I'm not giving, I'm not putting anything out. And the only thing I will put out is going to be uh, to destroy. <laughs> wow. I don't, know what to right. take, I don't know where to take it now, Harry. I don't know whether to sort of be more serious and try and get some, some expletives out of you or I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I dropped a C-bomb last night on one of my lives. You know, for some reason it needed that. It really did. It needed a C bomb. Do you know? I I think I'm glad we're doing the webinar together. I'm not sure us doing live presentations oh, that could be a bit that could be interesting because I, I also have been known to drop that mm -hmm. particular bomb. I mean, I'm so right. I, when I'm working with parents and professionals, we do a lot. I do a lot of training around managing and de-escalating aggression, things like that. And I like to get into the role play. And I feel like you know, if you can't handle being called a <laughs> well, fucking country gentleman country gentleman is what i said although still said the f word but you know i apologize if we offended anyone or i offended anyone let's not get harry involved in this but i do blame him and in that moment yes, then exactly you're not going to handle it in the moment of challenge so hey. i'm glad you dropped the c-bomb we broke it i broke my duck i'm off the hook here <laughs> This is coming out under the name of a Or maybe I'm just a terrible influence. <laughs> I just have to hope that I too do so much talking at work that none of my colleagues actually listen to an hour <laughs> of me talking. But then they might be interested in you, so they might. Oh, God. Maybe I'll edit it. No, please don't. You've got to keep I, that in. I think I will. I insist.
<laughs> I'll, I'll say you only agreed to, to let it go out if, if I kept it in. <laughs> blame you for it. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. I don't know where to go next now with that. Well, I'm looking forward to the webinar now, that's for sure. Oh, me too. That'd be great fun. Um, are either of us going to be able to remember the date without looking? I've got it up here somewhere. Let me I should probably do that. Webinar with Sam on the 26th of June at 8 p.m. Well done, Harry. Right. Here we go. And action. So, um, yes, I'm really looking forward to the webinar that is happening on the 26th of June at 8 p.m. We definitely didn't spend time it. You got it. You nailed it. Figuring you nailed it out. Um, yeah, so that's good. So, we're going to be looking at looking into the future, really, forward planning, um, pathways to success for individuals or uh, autistic people with a PDA profile. Is that? We'll yeah, go yeah, you got it. We'll go with that one until it, you don't want to go with it anymore. And then you completely. <laughs> I'll decide when we leave it behind. Out. Okay. <laughs> um, Just as it becomes um, automatic, then we'll we'll move on. Well, I, I just did want to, I did want to ask you about something actually. Um, one of the sort of books that does refer to the PDAs thing is the PDA by PDAs, and that's lots of like you know forum posts, yeah. stories from people with PDA. I mean, do you think that moving forward? Is that the best way for us to think about supporting people with this profile is actually to look at the people out there and their experiences and what's happened with them and, and of know, course this is there there is nothing more valuable than listening to someone's personal experience mm -hmm. well, there you go I, I think, really well, do you know that that is like a lovely little sound bite to end a podcast where we've talked yeah it is. about lots of your personal experiences so well done harry it's almost if it was is it as if it was deliberate <laughs> um but yeah so uh, anyone that's interested in the webinar I'll, I'll put a link up in the blurb under the, the podcast episode uh like i said it's 26 of june uh 8 p.m which is, should hopefully allow people to maybe start getting the kids to bed and accessing if they need to um and yeah, that'll be myself and Harry for a couple of hours uh, covering that topic of looking into the future mm. for autistic people with a PDA profile. Uh, in the meantime, thanks for listening. Please like, please share, please comment, please review. Do all those things. Helps us get more free content out there uh, that can hopefully help people. So thank and thanks again, for Harry. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Sam. As always, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. And we will see you... We, do you say that, but you're at home, aren't you? So I am. I'm in the well, it is a pleasure to be there. <laughs> I'm not sure, really. <laughs> well, thanks a lot, Harry, and I'll, I'll, we'll speak again on the 26th. Okay, bye, everyone. Cheers, everyone.